Welcome to chapter 11. This chapter is on sexual orientation. So sexual orientation is defined as um, a term specifying the sex of those to whom a person is primarily, romantically, sexually, and emotionally attracted to. So sexual orientation has lots of different orientations. So we'll start with some of the most well-known. There are heterosexuals, and these are a person who is attracted romantically and sexually to persons of the opposite sex. They're also referred to as straight. And then there is a homosexual who is a person who is attracted romantically and sexually to persons of their own sex. And so generally the term gay is applied to both men and women, um, where the term lesbian is applied to a female with a homosexual orientation. Another common term is bisexual, and this is a person who is attracted romantically and sexually to members of both sexes. So another term that you should be familiar with is heterocentric, which is the assumption of a universal heterosexual orientation. And so when people are heterocentric, they tend to take heterosexuality for granted and, having, and have a hard time understanding and accepting non-heterosexual individuals. So estimates show that about 10% of people have a non-heterosexual orientation. Okay, so we are going to start with historical perspectives, and we're going to talk specifically about the Stonewall Riot. So in 1969, homosexuality was illegal. It was even illegal to serve alcohol to homosexuals. So the Stonewall Inn in New York City was one of the very few gay bars, but once a month it was raided and its patrons were arrested. On June 28, 1969, the patrons fought back against a police raid and a riot ensued. This got national attention and people began the gay rights movement. Meetings began in Central Park and now every June there are marches and parades that are held to commemorate Stonewall and the beginning of the gay rights movement. So let's watch a video now that will give us more details on the Stonewall riot. The Stonewall Bar to me is a terrible place where something great happened. The swinging 60s were a time of public revolt and political action. Many marginalized groups were making great strides. Many, except for one. In many states, people could be incarcerated as a sexual psychopath the minute it was known you were homosexual. You had no legitimate right to really even exist as gay people. So there was no place where you could be sure at the beginning of the night that you wouldn't suffer an attack during the night. During that period, um, uh, beating up gays was a national sport. It was actually against the law to serve an open homosexual at a bar. It was against the law. Gay New Yorkers could at least gather at the Stonewall Inn. It was a CD bar. It was run by the mafia. They only opened it to make money for off of gay people, to exploit gay people. It was the best bar at the time. And of course you could dance, the music was great. We just didn't have things like that. The bar was dirty, it was unpleasant. The jukebox was great. And the uh, drag queens controlled that. Police raids on Stonewall were often and routine, until one night. On Friday night, June 27, 1969, the New York police force pulled off its biggest raid ever on the Stonewall Inn. They immediately ran into resistance from the transvestites who uh, were mouthing off to them, saying things like, I have my civil rights too, don't touch me, get your hands off me. A friend called Jerry to tell him about the raid. His exact words were, it's Miss Who's, there's a riot at the Stonewall, get down here right now. The angry crowd pelted the police with bottles and rocks. And as we kept pushing them backwards, they were laughing nervously. But it seemed to get more serious, and we pushed them back into the bar. The police were stunned. I mean, those were the riot police at a gay bar, unheard of. There were thousands of people involved out in the streets opposing the police. Nothing like that had ever happened before. And then this one queen, Miss New Orleans, was very skinny. She was so outraged, she started grabbing a meter and almost single-handedly 
draw the meter out of the street. And then these queens use it as a battering ram. This is what shocked me. And I said, my God. The definitive turning point came when a lesbian had been inside the bar uh, and was being roughed up by the police as they took her out of the bar into a patrol wagon. She also said to the onlooker, she says, why don't you guys do something? And then everything went crazy. The crowd erupted into an on-again, off-again fight against the cops. I got there about an hour after it started. The scene that I was focused on, which I'll never forget, was the famous line where all the drag queens were doing a Rockettes kick line, singing, we are the Stonewall girls, we wear our hair in curls. We wear our dungarees above our Nelly knees. When it comes to boys, we merely hip my toe. And that's when it made. That was enough of them. <laughs> the cops just got us. Well, I said to myself, heaven has arrived. The thing that was going through my head was good. Finally, why not? I spent the whole rest of the night throwing rocks and making uh, um, lame attempts at turning over cars. And it was a ball. These were our sisters. They were all fighting. and. I couldn't walk away. I didn't want to walk away. I remember it being fabulous, or as I say, fabulous. Gates fought back that night, I think, because of a string of assaults. It, it was building up. It was the first time that most of us actually got to vent our anger. From the fighting, a movement was born. If it had just been those nights of uh, rioting and, and outrage, and nothing followed it, um, nothing would have changed. The first gay rights organizations were created after Stonewall. We put on dances that were by and for the gay community. We built up a huge uh, treasury. It was used to start the first gay community center. A year after the riots, the group marked the occasion with a march. We decided that the march should start around Stonewall on Christopher Street and march up to Central Park. We had threats. We were scared. We often refer to it as the first run because we went so fast. By the time that we got to the, to the uh, park and I turned around, it was unbelievable. It was one of the great moments of my life. I get chills just thinking about it because in one year, we went from a bunch of hidden people who fought back one night in the dark to thousands of people marching in the sunlight into Central Park as proud, openly gay and lesbian people. When I die, that will be one of the things I'm going to remember most. And with those first steps, the modern Pride Parade began. Okay, so let's talk about sexual orientation from Kinsey's point of view. So when Kinsey did his studies on sexuality in the 1950s, he discovered that people's responses to questions about same-sex behavior varied greatly, and it led him to, development, uh, to develop a sexual orientation scale in which people are not entirely straight or gay. In fact, he said very few people would be classified as exclusively heterosexual or exclusively homosexual. So according to Kinsey, if you fall right in the middle of this scale, then you would be bisexual. So in terms of bisexuality, many people have thought that being bisexual was a way for people to hide their homosexuality, or a bisexual person was really just on their way to becoming a homosexual. So consequently, there have been few studies on bisexuality. Um, some, have re some bisexual people have been rejected by both the gay and straight communities. Um, there's some myths that bisexual people are more promiscuous than other orientations, and that's not true. Uh, they do not just have sex with anyone and everyone. They are just attracted to who they are attracted to, regardless of biological sex. So sexual orientation does not exclusively mean who you have sex with. Even a celibate person has a sexual orientation. So let's watch a bit of clip now on bisexuality and the Kinsey scale. I'm bi! You're bi! Are we all a little bi? Well, at least a third of us are. Stop 
up everyone, Lacey Green here. According to a new study coming out of the UK, a full 29% of Americans under the age of 30 identify somewhere on the bisexual spectrum. Amongst the British under 25, that number jumps to almost 50%. What? That's a lot of bisexuality. This is really interesting for a number of reasons. For one, that number drops off a cliff amongst older people. In the over 45 age category, only 8% identify as bi. Former studies also put the number of bisexuals at about 3.5% for American women and 1.1% for American men of all ages. Big difference. Scientists have actually thought for a long time that the numbers are a little low because of stigmas related to bisexuality. Bisexuality is a distinct category from being gay or lesbian or straight because those are all forms of monosexuality or being attracted to one gender. A good chunk of people who are bi hang out in limbo land, confused about how to label their sexuality. They might swing back and forth between homo and hetero before realizing, hey, I'm actually bi. This process is sometimes falsely interpreted by others as bisexuality being a choice. Men who are bisexual are less likely to be accepted overall, and they're sometimes thought to be closeted or on the way to coming out as gay, especially if he's dating a guy. Women who are bisexual are more likely to deal with the opposite. People sometimes think they're straight and just doing it for attention. Funny how we tend to accuse both bisexual men and women of secretly being attracted to men. So this poll was conducted by asking people where they fall on the Kinsey scale. You probably heard of the Kinsey scale. It's a pretty old school concept concocted by Alfred Kinsey in 1948. The scale goes from zero to six, with zero being completely 100% hetero, to six being completely 100% homo. And at three, a person is completely bisexual. And everything in between is just varying degrees of bisexuality. Later, X was added to the end of the scale to connote asexuality or a lack of sexual attraction. Now in the 1940s, the scale was a pretty radical new take on sexuality. It was one of the first formal acknowledgments that sexuality is a continuum. It's not black and white, and a person might even identify at different places on the Kinsey scale throughout their life. Of course, studies like these have some people asking, hey, if we strip away all the labels, aren't we all a little bi deep down? Kinsey thought that even straight people having really close friends of the same sex could put them on the bisexual spectrum. Freud thought that we all have some innate bisexuality. The reality is this, the perspective's a little outdated, and it ultimately contributes to bisexual erasure. There are definitely people out there only attracted to one gender, and actively experiencing persistent attraction to multiple genders isn't the same thing as being open-minded about sexuality. Bisexuality is a distinct sexual orientation. I do think it's possible that conflating bisexuality with open-mindedness could be part of why the numbers are dramatically higher, and maybe the linear Kinsey scale isn't the best tool to evaluate these things. There are over 200 different sexuality scales now, including one of my faves, the Klein Sexual Orientation orientation grid, which dissects many more dimensions of a person's orientation. If there's one thing for certain though, it's that human sexuality is a whole lot more fluid and varied than a lot of people like to think, and people are feeling more comfortable being open about it. Bring on the future, baby. Feel free to share your thoughts down below, and until next time, stay braless. We've learned a lot of things from the Ashley Madison hack. Mostly that the world is going straight to hell, so thank you, internet. Okay, for lecture activity one, I would like for you to tell me your thoughts on the Kinsey scale. Do you think that um, human sexuality is fluid and that most people are not entirely heterosexual or homosexual, but instead fall somewhere on this continuum? Or do you think that sexuality is binary and people are either gay or straight? Um, so give me your response to that and then explain your response in two to three sentences. Okay, so many people wonder if sexual orientation is a choice. And homosexuals are often asked if and when they chose to be gay. But what's interesting is that we don't ask heterosexuals when they chose to be straight. So it kind of seems ridiculous to ask a straight person these questions. So why then do we ask gay people these questions? So on June 26, 2015, the Supreme Court uh, ruled that it was unconstitutional for states to ban homosexuals from being able to get married. And so same-sex marriage became legal on a federal level in our country. Prior to that, non-heterosexual couples were denied the same rights as heterosexual couples. So they were not legally entitled to a variety of things. For example, uh, they would not get the inheritance if their partner died. They weren't allowed to participate in medical decisions. They couldn't get insurance coverage from their partner's employer, child custody rights, family leave benefits, domestic violence protection, 
community property rights and divorce, etc. But now that uh, the law has passed, they are entitled to the same rights as home, um, heterosexual couples. And we just recently kind of caught up to other countries in terms of same-sex marriage. Countries like Canada, Argentina, Germany, Belgium, Netherlands, Portugal, Iceland, South Africa, Norway, Sweden, and Spain have had same-sex marriage legal for years already. So in regards to sexual orientation and having children, a common prejudicial question to gay couples is, you can't have children, so what's the point of your relationship? But what's kind of ironic about that is that people don't generally ask infertile people or people who choose not to have kids the question of, hey, if you're not having kids, what's the point? Um, so it is kind of prejudicial towards uh, homosexuals then. But research show that gay couples make great parents and their children have no differences in cognitive development, psychological adjustment, gender identity, or sexual orientation. And gay people can have children from previous marriages, artificial insemination, having intercourse with a friend, adoption, egg and sperm donation, and there are other options as well. So some interpersonal qualities of non-heterosexual relationships um, can be seen here on the slide. So they tend to be more upbeat about their relationships, according to research. They use more humor and remain affectionate in conflict. They're more able to calm down and soothe each other after conflict. They're less hostile and controlling over their partner, and they move past problems more quickly than uh, heterosexual couples, according to research. So studies show that overall relationship satisfaction and quality is really not moderated by the sexual orientation of the couple. Um, in other words, it doesn't really matter if the couple is gay or straight in terms of their overall relationship satisfaction. However, those research findings that I just uh, read to you are actually a few specific differences between straight and gay couples. Okay, let's watch a video now on gay parents. Hey everyone, welcome to What The Stuff. Today we're going to talk about families. They're one of the most important things a person has. In recent years though, we've heard numerous people, organizations, and even courts debating things like same-sex marriage and same-sex parenting. And unfortunately, there are also a lot of myths surrounding these topics. So let's bust a few, shall we? Here are five of the biggest. There's no real scientific support that same-sex parenting is bad. Sure, you might hear opponents of the published research claim that it's tainted with liberal bias, but research conducted on LGBT parents and their kids has been overwhelmingly positive. A host of respected organizations have issued statements giving gay parenting their stamp of approval. And not just some fringe outfits. We're talking the American Medical Association, the American Psychological Association, the American Association for Marriage and Family Therapy, and more. The list goes on. Take a 2002 policy statement released by the American Academy of Pediatrics. It reiterated that based on scientific literature, quote, children who grow up with one or two gay and or lesbian parents fare as well in emotional, cognitive, social, and sexual functioning as do children whose parents are heterosexual. In straight household context, studies have linked the absence of dads to higher rates of delinquency, drug abuse, and lower educational attainment. But New York University sociologist Judith Stacy's meta-analysis of 33 studies found that parental gender had little bearing on kids' well-being. The most influential variables were instead resources and childcare commitment. These hold even greater sway than the number of parents in a home. In other words, two parents invested are the best case scenario, but even one involved parent is better than a detached couple, no matter their sexual orientation. Even if LGBT couples create an enriching home environment, what happens to the kids when they venture from the roost? By one 2010 estimate, 41% of 10-year-old children with gay parents encountered bullying or isolation. But this doesn't mean they're at greater risk of becoming depressed or forming fewer friendships. The University of California at San Francisco researchers who collected that bullying data went back and checked in with the same adolescents seven years later. 
and found no lasting psychological damage from any parent-related persecution. Additionally, 25 years worth of studies consistently debunk theories that psychological and social pitfalls are in store for children of lesbian and gay parents. Outcomes of anxiety, depression, substance abuse, and socialization aren't markedly different for kids raised in gay or lesbian-headed households. Repeated analyses have found that parents' sexual orientation is not a factor. In other words, kids can and do grow up with good heads on their shoulders regardless of their parents' sexual orientation. Now, one of the most common anxieties regarding LGBT parenting is that the children will inevitably become gay, as if that would actually also be a problem. University of Virginia psychologist Charlotte J. Patterson points out that such anxiety is unfounded, since non-heterosexual orientation was long ago eliminated as a disorder or illness. And regardless, statistics indicate that children don't necessarily inherit the identical gender and sexual identities of their parents. In fact, research on children raised by lesbian couples had found that most of the kids ultimately identify as straight in adulthood. For instance, in one 1989 study of adolescents raised by lesbians and straight parents, the only participant to identify as gay belonged to a hetero-headed household. Hmm. Are same-sex couples identical to straight couples when it comes to raising kids and running a household? No, and that isn't a bad thing. As Judith Stacy points out, differences don't equate deficiencies in this case. Research has highlighted some unique hallmarks of lesbian parenting, including more equal division of chores and childcare, and greater parent-child emotional openness. Of course, just as not all straight couples make identical decisions, neither do LGBT parents. But the data clearly show that kids raised by gay and lesbian parents grow into successful, well-adjusted young adults. And parents of all stripes can take away an important lesson. There is more than one road to raising a happy, healthy child. Well, thanks so much for watching. What do you think is the most important thing about parenting? Let me know in the comments below. And hey, if you like this video, come visit me over at Stuff Mom Never Told You. We bust myths over there as well. So we are going to turn our discussion to biological influences on sexual orientation. And we'll begin by looking at the brain. Research shows that sexual orientation is not a choice and cannot be altered through quote-unquote restorative programs, camps, conversion therapy, etc. Um, so what we do know is that in the brain, there is the anterior hypothalamus, which is responsible for sexual urges. And it is larger in straight men than it is in gay men. Um, however, it's the same size in gay men and women. Studies show that lesbians are 91% more likely to be left-handed. Gay men are 34% like, more likely to be left-handed than heterosexuals. And we also know in studies that uh, ears make faint noises in response to clicking sound. And studies found that lesbian ears make softer noises than female heterosexual ears. Studies also show that there are differences in visual spatial abilities in gay versus straight men. And studies have found significant differences in brain activity between homosexuals and heterosexuals. One study found the degree of symmetry between left, uh, the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere of the brain are different in heterosexuals versus homosexuals. Um, it also found that gay men and straight women brains are similar, and lesbians have similar brains to straight men, as you can see illustrated here on the slide. All right, so let's watch this video clip on the um, biological influences on sexual orientation. This five-week milestone could be another stage where identical twins develop key differences before they're even born. Celso and Jesus Cardenas are identical twins who were raised together. They remained physically similar as they grew up, but their tastes and interests began to diverge. Celso became interested in dance and academia, while Jesus preferred sports. The most surprising difference between the two brothers is that Celso, wearing black, is gay. 
The differing sexual orientation of identical twins allows us to investigate one of science's most controversial questions. Are people born gay? Celso and Jesus were raised by the same parents in the same household. So, they shared the same environment at a crucial time in their personal development. In the general population, the chance of someone being gay is less than 5%. Unless you have a gay twin. Then the chances are much higher. If you are fraternal, sharing half your genes, there's nearly a 25% chance that you will also be gay. If you are identical, sharing all your genes, there's about a 50% chance you will also be gay. This suggests that there must be some genetic component to our sexuality. But it can't all be up to genes. Otherwise, every identical pair would either be both gay or both straight. Some other factor must be at play. In their first few weeks, all fetuses develop along similar lines. If nothing changed, each one of us would be born female. Fetuses with the male Y chromosome will form testes at about week six that produce the hormone testosterone. But at about the eighth week, the testosterone is released and may affect early brain development. Testosterone masculinizes the body. It also masculinizes the brain, including the hypothalamus, which partially controls who we find sexually attractive. Some scientists believe that the more the hypothalamus is exposed to testosterone, the more it sets the stage for a sexual inclination toward women. Occasionally, a male fetus doesn't produce sufficient testosterone, or its brain doesn't absorb enough to shape it along heterosexual lines. If this theory is correct, then it may be that Celso absorbed enough testosterone to masculinize his body, but not enough to fully differentiate his brain. As a result, he was left with a desire for men. Many mysteries remain, but twins like Celso and Jesus play a crucial role in informing scientists about how and when sexuality develops. Epigenetics reveals that even if their DNA code is the same, the way it functions can differ. The human genome contains around 25,000 genes, each with its own specific function, like producing energy or directing cell division. Now, geneticists are investigating a previously unknown aspect of the genome called the epigenome. A series of chemicals that act like switches are capable of activating or deactivating individual genes. One of these switches works by a process called DNA methylation. Enzymes inside a cell attach a minuscule molecular compound, a methyl group, to a gene. This compound can deactivate or at times activate the gene, but the gene itself remains. The cell's DNA profile is unchanged. The activation and deactivation of genes during early development could explain many twists of fate that affect us all. Why one person is struck by disease and another is spared. Epigenetics may also play a significant role in determining sexuality. If sexual preference is associated with an unidentified gene, it may be that the epigenetic suppression or activation of this gene dictates sexual preference.
These genetic switches may be the answer to why one twin absorbs more testosterone than the other, resulting in one being gay and the other straight. It's becoming clear that our health, personality, tastes, and even appearance aren't the product of our genes or our environment, but that nature and nurture are inextricably bound, with epigenetics the biological link between the two. So as I mentioned, researchers have found that there is a difference in spatial ability and auditory differences in homosexuals and heterosexuals. However, this may be due to brain structures and or functions, or it could be due to prenatal hormonal exposure. So researchers have found a difference in finger length for heterosexuals and homosexuals that may also be due to prenatal hormonal exposure. Another kind of piece of evidence for the effect of hormones on our sexuality is that there is a drug called DES that was given to pregnant women to prevent miscarriage from 1938 to 1971. However, it actually caused an increased risk of cancer and fertility and infertility. And in addition, studies show that females that were exposed to DES are actually more likely to be gay or bisexual. Another study found what's called the older brother effect. And this study says that the more older biological brothers a boy has, the more likely he is to be gay. In fact, each brother increases the likelihood of be being homosexual by 33%. And the reason for this is that the female body produces antibodies against male fetal cells that get stronger with each male baby. And so in order for the males to survive in the womb, the mother's body changes its hormonal balance, possibly producing less male hormones called androgens. So let's watch a video now on the older brother effect. While biologists look at hormones for answers about human sexuality, other scientists are looking for patterns in statistics. And hard as this is to believe, they have found something they call the older brother effect. The more older brothers a man has, the greater that man's chance of being gay. What? Say that again? The more older brothers a man has, uh -huh. the greater the likelihood that that man will be gay. Is that true? That is absolutely true. Absolutely true? Absolutely. If this comes as a shock to you, you're not alone. But it turns out it's one of the most solid findings in this field, demonstrated in study after study. And the numbers are significant. For every older brother a man has, his chances of being gay increase by one-third. Older sisters make no difference, and there's no corresponding effect for lesbians. A firstborn son has about a 2% chance of being gay, and the numbers rise from there. The theory is it happens in the womb. Somehow, the mother's body is remembering how many boys she's carried before. Mm -hmm. The favored hypothesis is that the mother may be making antibodies when she sees a boy the first time and then affect subsequent boys when she carries them uh, in you utero. Mean, you mean like she's carrying a foreign substance? And if you think about it, a, a woman who's carrying a son for the first time, she is carrying a foreign substance. Yeah. There are some proteins encoded on his Y chromosome that her body has never seen before and that her immune system would be expected to regard as invaders. And so, so that's the, a theory. That's the theory. It's still not proved, and it gets even stranger. One of the things we've only found out lately is that older brothers affect a boy only if the boy is right-handed. If the boy Wait is... Wait a minute. I know. If the boy is left-handed, if his brain is organized in a left-handed fashion, <laughs> it doesn't matter how many older brothers he has. His probability of being gay is just like the rest of the population. All right, so now let's look at the effect of genetics on our sexuality. Um, so identical twins that are raised in different families are actually likely to have the same sexual orientation, which indicates a genetic explanation. If one twin is homosexual, the other is 50% more likely to also be homosexual than non-twin siblings or fraternal twins. So scientists have not yet identified a quote-unquote gay gene, but even if we did, it would only explain about 50% of the reason we have the sexual orientation we have. The other reasons are most likely due to hormones, brain structure and function, and etc. However, in December of 2012, researchers think that they may have found what are called epigenetics or epimarks, and these are things that tell your gene what to do. 
um, so they can kind of turn genes on or off, and these might play a part in controlling sexual orientation. So let's watch a video clip now on um, epigenetics. Hey everyone, my name is Lacey Green and you're watching D News. Despite the fact that homosexuality is observed in over 1,500 different species in the animal kingdom, there is still a debate amongst the homo sapiens about whether or not homosexuality is natural. People who think that homosexuality isn't natural think of it as a choice or a lifestyle, that the natural preference is for the opposite sex. Others say that it's not a choice, it's an inherent preference for the same sex, that just like straight people don't choose who they're attracted to, neither do gay people. Science has dug its way into this hot debate. Owing to a few popular studies conducted in the past 20 years, the leading thought is that homosexuality is genetic, it's something you inherit. Although pinpointing a specific gene has been very tricky business. Evolutionarily speaking, gay and lesbian folks are less likely to have children, so how then is it possible for a gene to be passed on to 8% of the population? A new study that came out recently claims to have an answer to this question, epigenetics. Epigenetics refers to a change in how a gene is expressed. The expression is changed not by a change in the DNA sequence, but by other mechanisms, in this case, changing exposure to testosterone in the womb. So to understand this, we ought to back up a little bit. In biology class, you learn that an XX chromosome means that the baby will become a female, and an XY chromosome will develop into a male. But why does XY become a male? Well, because genes on the Y chromosome trigger the release of testosterone, which prompts the development of other male characteristics. Now, during this process, the hormone release is regulated by ethymarks, or sex-related genes that are turned on and off to keep male or female development on a steady course even when hormones are spiking and dipping and all kinds of crazy pregnancy things are happening. This regulation process called epichanges controls how masculine or feminine a fetus is. Now normally epichanges are erased after they're activated. They aren't supposed to be passed on from a parent to a child because they're triggered by the environment. But occasionally they do pass. And when that child has children of their own, the idea is that child could be gay. Kind of confusing, I know, but basically it's about hormone exposure in the womb that affects sexual preferences in offspring a generation down the line. Now, the study is not conclusive, but it is scientifically significant. We're slowly advancing our understanding of homosexuality, a great evolutionary question. It's also socially significant, because one of the main arguments used to justify discrimination against LGBT folks is that they're choosing to be gay, that this is a bad choice, so they deserve to be punished with discriminatory policies. But as this research unravels, we're starting to see that sexual orientation may not actually be a lifestyle choice, that it very well could be an immutable characteristic, something that you can't change, just like your race or your sex. And since we now legally acknowledge that racism and sexism are kind of not okay, maybe society at large can extend that attitude to homophobia as well. In that sense, research like this moves us forward toward a more tolerant and peaceful world. And personally, I kind of get down with that. So guys, let me know what your thoughts are about this development, and hey, make sure you subscribe so that you can get some more D news tomorrow. So when it comes to the nature versus nurture argument, and we look at the experiential and environmental influences on sexual orientation, there's not a lot of evidence. Um, in fact, the following are myths that have actually been debunked by scientific research. In fact, the research found that gay and straight people had these experiences or situations equally. So the myths are that homosexual men had overbearing moms and weak fathers. Lesbians had cold, unloving mothers and absent fathers. Homosexuals grew up hating and fearing members of the opposite sex. Most homosexuals were molested by a same-sex person as a child. Homosexuals engaged in same-sex erotic play as children. And homosexuals likely have a gay mom or dad. Again, these have all been debunked by science and found that gay and straight people have these experiences equally. So research shows that having gay parents has no effect on sexual orientation, and children are not growing up gay more than kids with straight parents. Research also shows that gay adults as kids often did not like to engage in traditional gender play with their same-sex peers. Instead, they engaged in what's called gender non-conforming behavior. And this is behavior that is inconsistent with traditional cultural expectations for a child's sex and considered more appropriate for children of the other sex. So girls playing with trucks, boys playing with dolls, for example. 
So the research that disagrees with biological explanations of homosexuality does not offer an exclusively environmental theory instead. It mostly just criticizes biological theory, stating that there really isn't enough conclusive information. No one really thinks environment alone explains sexuality in the fields of science. Okay, so based on what you have learned about biological and environmental influences on sexuality, what are your conclusions? How do you think we develop our sexuality? Do you think it's mostly biological, environmental, or a combination of both? So for lecture activity two, I'd like for you to respond to that question in two to three sentences. So Daryl Bem created a biological and environmental interactive approach to explaining sexuality that he calls exotic becomes erotic theory. And this is his explanation for the interaction of the biological and environmental factors in determining a person's sexual orientation. Bem says that biology determines our temperament, but not necessarily our sexual orientation. And he says temperament determines the activities a child will prefer. So if they're lazy, they might prefer more calm activities. If they're aggressive, they might perform, uh, prefer more competitive sports type activities. And so then he goes on to say that if they engage in gender conforming behavior and play with the same sex, then they will see the opposite sex as being exotic. And when he says exotic, he's referring to that as being different or strange. And so gender conforming behavior is behavior that is consistent with traditional cultural expectations for a child's sex. So we talked on an earlier slide about non uh, con non traditional behavior, like when girls play with um, trucks or when boys play with uh, princesses, for example. So gender conforming behavior is consistent with traditional cultural expectations. So boys playing with trucks, girls playing with dolls, for example. So Bem says if uh, kids engage in gender non-conforming behavior and play with opposite sex, um, play with the opposite sex, then they will see the same sex as exotic, so different or strange. Seeing the same or other sex as exotic produces a physiological arousal that in childhood leads to strong emotions against them. In puberty, those physiological responses transform from exotic into erotic attraction. And so if you were a person that was engaging in gender non-conforming behavior, then you would have seen the uh, same sex as being exotic, exotic, and in adolescence, you would now see them as erotic. And if you were uh, playing with uh, conforming toys, you would see the opposite sex as being exotic. And then once you got into um, adolescence, they would become erotic to you. So some of the um, people who look at Daryl Bem's theories, psychologists um, and physicians and scientists who look at Daryl Bem's theories and others like it, ask, do the origins of sexual orientation really even matter? And so there are four basic negative or ignorant attitudes about homosexuality. The first is that it's immoral or sinful. The second is that it's unnatural. The third is that it's contagious. And the fourth is that it's chosen and can be unchosen. So showing sexuality is biological poses an argument against these negative attitudes. However, researchers assert that many people with these attitudes will find a way to interpret science with a bias that supports their ideas anyway. And researchers also fear that placing people in distinct categories, for example, stray, gay, uh, straight, gay, or bi, does a disservice to society because sexuality is actually more diverse than that. So non-heterosexual individuals find staying in the closet too stressful and emotionally unbearable from living a lie. And studies show that when people come out, they are physically and psychologically healthier, happier, and have better relationships. So when do people usually come out of the uh, metaphorical closet, so to speak? People usually begin realizing they are homosexual when puberty starts, but they usually feel different from other kids much earlier than puberty. Kids in general don't really understand or deeply think about sexuality, so it's not really until puberty when they start to kind of figure out um, their sexual orientation. 
And so they usually come out in their late teens, early adulthood, but it can even happen in old age. It just depends on the person. They may be married or divorced, have kids, and all those factors play a role in when someone decides to uh, tell their friends and family about their sexual orientation. So the coming out process involves gradual steps of uh, stages of thoughts, realizations, and behaviors. So generally the first step is identity confusion, which is feeling unsure about sexual orientation. This is followed by identity assumption, which is acknowledging being gay to oneself. The third step in the coming out process is identity acceptance, which is becoming comfortable with one's uh, own sexuality. And the fourth step is identity synthesis and commitment. And this is being openly gay and incorporating it into your routine life with pride and without shame. So unfortunately, there can be some potential dangers and pitfalls along with some joys of coming out. Um, it is possible that a person coming out would be subjected to ridicule and rejection by peers, family, their church. There have been cases of people coming out and being evicted or denied housing, uh, losing jobs, denial of access to military service, other forms of discrimination, and even physical violence. However, many people coming out will never experience most of these, but the fear of the possibility of this type of rejection or ridicule takes an emotional toll. Studies found that teens struggling with coming out are more likely to be depressed, abuse drugs, have eating disorders, and be homeless. In terms of homosexuality and suicide, studies show that gay teens attempt and commit suicide significantly more than straight teens. In fact, they're five times more likely to do so. The percentage of teens attempting suicide is gay males uh, at 28% versus straight males at 4%, lesbians at 20% versus straight females at 14%. Let's watch a video now of uh, people talking about coming out. I'm going to read a story about coming out. Okay. I'm 20 years old. I'm gay. And I'm in a loving relationship with the man of my dreams. I know that if I come out, my family and many of the people I've grown up with will disown me. I know people like this. The sacrifice of my personal silence for my parents' pride is worth it. Watching other people come out makes me happy and gives me a sense of hope. Yet at the same time, it hurts that I can't bring myself to do the same. That sucks because this guy is like trapped. He's like completely trapped. I, I have a friend that's really close to me that can't come out because he's scared of the same thing. So that's that hits really close to home. And it's too bad because they're a wonderful person and I want them to be happy. I'm 20 and I'm from Florida. I only realized that I might not be straight a year ago. I watched season one of Orange is the New Black three times and had no idea why I liked it so much. Um, full frontal nudity within like the first 10 seconds of episode one, season one. I had that same experience when I was watching American Pie 2 when I was like 13 years old. Then one night after I had a dream about a girl, I woke up in the middle of the night sweating and stressed out and I started crying. That day I skipped school and work and stayed at home and watched every lesbian movie on Netflix. I haven't come out yet because it scares me. I care a lot about what people think about me. I've had multiple people ask me if I was gay before. I've always denied it. This is hitting close to home though, for real. It's a lot harder when people ask you if you're gay before you're ready to admit it, not only to yourself, but to them. I know my parents, siblings, and friends wouldn't care, but it's still really scary. It's a process for everybody, so you have to respect that. They're even acknowledging the fact that they know their parents, siblings, and friends won't care. I think that this person is in the best possible situation. I'm 17, from the West Coast, and I've known from a pretty young age that I wasn't a boy, but I wasn't exactly a girl either. It was really hard growing up around people who constantly put me down for showing interest in anything related to being feminine. My friends and family all made fun of me and called me a faggot. That really wore me down. I would wear dresses sometimes, once I borrowed from my older sister. I bet you looked better in them than she did. I also landed me in some broken bones. They'll pick on you if you're not wearing a dress. They'll pick on you if you are wearing a dress. So just wear the dress. I don't want people telling me to pick a side already 
but that is just confusing to them. I just want people not to call me a girl or a boy because I'm not those things. Regardless of what people say to you, you are beautiful. I just wish I could come out without being scared of my identity being valid to some people. I think it's awesome that your sister is supporting you and honey, wear those dresses. I totally hear you on not wanting to have to say it because it's just who you are. And you have the right to be true to yourself. So just keep being you. At this point in my life, only a handful of friends know who I am. I've known that I'm bisexual for a while. I mean, surely if those people on TV were brave enough to come out, I could too, right? Any hope that I had, any dream that I had for my family would accept me for who I am slowly starting to disappear. As a parent, that just makes me sad that I wouldn't want my child to think that she couldn't believe that she could tell me anything, you know? I've never been so terrified of my own family. I'll never come out. Not for lack of wanting to, maybe because if I do, I'll lose my family. I'll never come out because my school is full of straight people who mercilessly bullied the last kid who came out. I'll never come out because I read what people write in the comment sections of a video. Because people think I'm disgusting. I don't get to come out. I can't. Oh my gosh, that's... <laughs> I hope the world changes enough in the next few years for this person to feel like they can't come out. You hear stories like that, that people's families don't accept them, but then to actually read it from someone's point of view is just so sad. For lecture activity three, I would like for you to tell me what you would do in an instance where a close friend or family member came out to you about having a homosexual or bisexual orientation. Uh, how would you feel about that? What would you say to them? So give me two to three sentences responding to that question. And if you've actually experienced someone coming out to you before and would rather talk about a real example, feel free to do that as well for lecture activity three. So there are laws against discrimination based on sexual orientation. Um, only 10% of countries have anti-discrimination laws regarding sexual orientations, and the USA is not actually one of them. Some people argue existing anti-discrimination laws protect gays, but no law specifically states it. Protected classes uh, currently in the United States are specific groups of people protected under federal and state anti-discrimination laws, and they are identified by race, religion, sex, age, etc. Some states have chosen to include sexual orientation, but often this only protects against discrimination in employment and education. So until recently, there were some laws prohibiting gay and lesbian sexual behaviors. For example, the sodomy laws. So these were laws prohibiting specific, specific sexual activities between adults, even in private and with their consent. Um, they included anal sex, but also included oral sex. Rarely ever uh, were these laws enforced, but then they, when they were, it was always against gays. And in 1998, people were called for a domestic disturbance, and they found two men engaged in anal sex. They were arrested on sodomy charges. Um, and this case, titled Lawrence versus Texas, uh, went all the way to the Supreme Court, and in 2003, all sodomy laws were overturned and deemed unconstitutional nationwide. So when we look at the psychology of violent crimes against non-heterosexual groups, it all kind of starts with Freud. Um, so Freud said that we all use these things called psychological defense mechanisms, which are really ways that we protect our ego. They're kind of like ways that we lie to ourselves. Um, and so if there's something that's anxiety producing or some urge or thought or something that we don't like about our past, um, we can use these different defense mechanisms to kind of protect ourselves from the truth. Um, so for example, there's one called reaction formation, which is a type of defense mechanism where a person engages in exaggerated behaviors in the opposite direction of their actual internal urges. Um, because they might consider those internal urges to be unacceptable or intolerable, um, or they might make them uncomfortable. So a simple example of this is like a little 
a boy on a playground who has a crush on a girl. He's not really comfortable with those feelings. He doesn't really get it. Girls are supposed to have cooties. This is weird. And so he pulls her hair and calls her names. Um, but when it comes to homophobia and violent crimes against non-heterosexual uh, groups, this theory of reaction formation is basically that there are people who are unsure of their sexuality. And when they see a gay person, it brings up these questions about their own sexuality. And to prove they are not gay, they resort to extreme behaviors. Um, in fact, there is a study that was very famous and it's been replicated several times where men were asked to answer questions about homosexuality. They then were um, placed in a room and asked to watch gay sexual behavior amongst other forms of pornography. And what's called a penile plethysmograph was placed on their penis and it can measure the intensity of an erection. Um, and so only men who had strong negative feelings towards homosexuality became aroused when watching gay sex. And later, those same homophobic men in a self-report rated that their sexual arousal was actually lower uh, than what the straight men said their sexual arousal was, trying to just kind of prove how gay they were not. So we're going to watch a clip now on this study. Um, it's the only clip I could find that was accurate, and it's very good. However, it does use some language that's a little bit unsavory in part. Um, there's a couple... Um, terms that are street jargon and jargon and not scientific in nature and could be considered somewhat offensive. So I apologize for those in advance, um, but hopefully you can look past them and get the um, idea behind the research because it's very compelling research. So check it out. We've decided the Bible is the word of God. We don't have to have a general assembly about what we believe. It's written in the Bible. All right, so we don't have to debate about what we should think about homosexual activity. It's written in the Bible. Meet Ted Haggard, American evangelical pastor, founder of the Association of Life-Giving Churches, and an outspoken defender of traditional family values. How ironic it is then that in 2006, Pastor Ted should happen to involve himself in a high-profile sex scandal involving methamphetamine abuse and male prostitution. Now meet Mark Foley, former representative for the state of Florida, proud Roman Catholic, and vehement opponent against homosexual rights. How ironic again that this gentleman should be forced to resign from Congress after getting caught up in a scandal over sexual advances towards underage male congressional pages. Now meet Larry Wide Stance Craig, congressman, Methodist, and yet another political activist against gay rights. How ironic again that this guy should happen to find himself pleading guilty to charges of lewd conduct after allegedly soliciting sex from an undercover police officer in an airport men's room. You know, at times like this, I'm reminded of an old saying. If it happens once, it's an anomaly. If it happens twice, it's a coincidence. But if it happens three times, then it's a pattern. So why is it that outspoken opponents of gay rights seem to keep getting caught in these intense gay scandals? Does science have any insight on this issue? Is there perhaps a link between homophobia and latent homosexuality? Consider the following experiment. Go and round up a group of heterosexual males between the ages of 18 and 31 and measure their scores on the index of homophobia scale. It's nothing complicated, really. The index is simply a numeric value determined by responses to a 25-part questionnaire. For example, on a scale of 1 to 5, how much do you agree with the statement, I would feel comfortable working closely with a male homosexual? Or perhaps, I would feel disappointed if I learned that my child was homosexual. Stuff like that. When finished, divide your subjects into two groups. Take all of your subjects with index scores above 50 and classify them as homophobic. Likewise, for all those who scored below 50, classify them as non-homophobic. Now comes the fun part. Take each subject and place them in a cozy, soft recliner in a private, soundproof room. Once the subject is settled in, present him with a four-minute display of the juiciest, sexiest, guy-on-girl pornography that you can get your dirty little hands on. Then, as the subject sits back, relaxes, and enjoys the show, measure his penile enlargement over the course of the video. Now, I know what some of you might be wondering. How on earth could anyone possibly measure penile enlargement? Well, that's a perfectly good question. After all, it's not like some technician is going to sit there with a ruler while the subject gets his rocks off. Well, as it turns out, the answer is actually quite simple. 
All you need is a mercury in rubber circumferential strain gauge, also known as a penile plethysmograph, or as I like to call it, the boner meter. Yes, medical science really does have instruments for this sort of thing. Although it kind of makes you wonder what the conversation must have been like where the researchers tried to convince the subjects to actually put this thing on. Once you've finished sampling erectile data from your trusty boner meter, ask yourself, does a little homophobia have any effect on a man's enjoyment of wholesome guy-on-girl action? Surely not, right? Well, if that's what you're thinking, then you're absolutely correct. As the graph clearly shows, the difference in penile diameter between each group was essentially negligible. Homophobes and non-homophobes appear to enjoy classic porn equally well. Who'd have thunk? Now let's shake things up a bit. After finishing his first round of scientific porn viewing, give your subject a few minutes to cool off and get ready for round two. This time, present him with yet another four-minute clip of sweet, delicious porn. Except now, instead of showing him ordinary heterosexual sex, show him the best lesbian sex that adult entertainment has to offer. Once again, be sure to make good use of that good old boner meter and take regular measurements of your subject's penile erections. Now let's ask ourselves again, does homophobia have any effect on a man's enjoyment of homosexual girl-on-girl -girl action? Surely it would, right? Well, actually, no. As far as physical erections are concerned, homophobic males appear to enjoy girl-on-girl -girl sex just as much as any other male. So no real difference here either. Now, let's shake things up one last time. With round two out of the way, give your subjects another brief cooldown period to prepare for round three. Only this time, show them a four-minute clip of homosexual guy-on-guy -guy pornography. Surely, homophobic men, men who literally feel uncomfortable in the physical presence of other gay men, will not manifest any arousal to such stimulus, right? Wrong. As the results clearly show, homophobic men tend to exhibit more than twice the erectile diameters of non-homophobic men while viewing male-on-male -male pornography. This result has even been replicated many times over throughout the scientific literature. The more outspoken a man is against homosexuals, the more likely it is that he himself harbors latent homosexual arousals. This is a phenomenon which I like to call Ted Haggard syndrome. The more his lips say no, the more likely his loins will say yes. So the next time you see another one of those creepy religious guys railing against the evils of same-sex marriage, ask yourself, what could possibly motivate this individual to take such a hard stance on such a minor cultural issue? In a world plagued by scarcity, corruption, hunger, poverty, greed, ignorance, and the grim specter of nuclear annihilation, is gay marriage really such a terrible threat to the future of humanity? Or could it just be that these men are psychologically reacting against a perceived threat to their own identities? So don't embrace the way God made you. Here's what you should do. Choose to be a hetero and seven foot two because Ted Haggard is completely heterosexual. Ted Haggard is completely heterosexual. Ted Haggard is completely heterosexual. Glory, how he blew ya. Okay, that's it for chapter 11, so if you could please submit your lecture activities and don't forget to complete the assignments associated with this chapter. We will see you for the next one. Have a great day.